Okay, said Dad finally, rubbing his palm over his face. Obviously, we understand the seriousness of the situation now, and we will do something about it. I don't think I'd ever seen Dad look so uncomfortable. I'm sorry, Dad. Well, we have some recommendation, answered Dr. Jansen. Obviously, we want to help everyone involved. Thank you for understanding, said Mom, getting her pocketbook ready as if she were getting up. But there are consequences, said Mr. Tushman, looking at Mom. Excuse me, she shot back at him. As I said in the beginning, Dr. Jansen interjected, the school has a very strict anti-bullying policy. Yeah, we saw how strict it was when you didn't expel Jack Will for punching Julian in the mouth. Mom answered quickly, yeah, take that, Mr. Tushman. Oh, come on. That was completely different, Mr. Tushman answered dismissively. Oh, answered Mom, punching someone in the face isn't bullying to you? Okay, okay, said Dad, raising his hand to keep Mr. Tushman from answering. Let's just cut to the chase, okay? What exactly are your recommendations, Hal? Dr. Jansen looked at him. Julian is being suspended for two weeks, he said. What? yelled Mom, looking at Dad, but Dad didn't look back. In addition, said Dr. Jensen, we recommend counseling. Nurse Molly has the names of several therapists who we think Julian should see. This is outrageous, interrupted Mom, steaming. Wait, I said, you mean I can't go to school? Not for two weeks, answered Mr. Tushman, starting immediately. But what about the trip to the nature retreat, I asked. You can't go, he answered coldly. No, I said, and now I was really about to cry. I want to go to the nature retreat. I'm sorry, Julian, Dr. Jensen said gently. This is absolutely ridiculous, said Mom, looking at Dr. Jensen. Don't you think you're overreacting a little? That kid didn't even read the notes. That's not the point, answered Mr. Tushman. I'll tell you what I think, said Mom. This is because you admitted a kid into the school who shouldn't have been admitted into the school in the first place, and you broke the rules to do it. And now you're just taking this out on my kid because I'm the one who had the guts to call you on it. Melissa, said Dr. Jensen, trying to calm her down. These children are too young to deal with things like this. Facial deformities, disfigurement, mom continued talking to Dr. Jensen. You must see that. Julian's had nightmares because of that boy. Did you know that? Julian has anxiety issues. Mom, I said, clenching my teeth. The board should have been consulted about whether breach or prep was the right place for a child like that, Mom continued. That's all I'm saying. We're just not set up for it. There are other schools that are, but we're not. You can choose to believe that if you want, answered Mr. Tushman, not looking at her. Mom rolled her eyes. This is a witch hunt, she, mur she murmured quietly. Looking out the window, she was fuming. I had no idea what she was talking about. Witches? What witches? Okay, Hal. You said you had some recommendations, Dad said to Dr. Jansen. He sounded gruff. Is that it? Two weeks suspension and counseling? We'd also like for Julian to write a letter of apology to August Pullman, said, Dr. Tush said Mr. Tushman. Apology? For what exactly, answered Mom. He wrote some stupid notes. Surely he's not the only kid in the world who's ever written a stupid note. It's more than a stupid note, answered Mr. Tushman. It's a pattern of behavior. He started counting on his fingers. It's the making faces behind the kid's back. It's the game he initiated where if someone touches Augie, he has to wash his hands. I couldn't believe Mr. Tushman even knew about the plague game. How do teachers know so much? It's social isolation, Mr. Tishman continued. It's creating a hostile atmosphere. And you know for a fact that Julian's, it's Julian who initiated all this, asked Dad. Social isolation, hostile atmosphere. Are you saying that Julian was the only kid who wasn't nice to this boy? Or are you suspending every kid who stuck his tongue out at this kid? Good one, Dad. Score one for the Albances. Doesn't it trouble you at all that Julian doesn't seem to be showing the least bit of remorse, said Mr. Tushman, squinting at Dad. Okay, let's just stop right there, Dad said quietly, pointing his finger in Mr. Tushman's face. Please, everyone, said Dr. Jensen, let's calm down a bit. Obviously, this is difficult.
After all we've done for this school, Mom answered, shaking her head. After all the money and the time we've put into this school, you would think we get just a little bit of consideration. She put her thumb and index finger together. Just a little. Dad nodded. He was still looking angrily at Mr. Tushman. And then he looked at Dr. Jansen. Well, this is right, he said. I think we deserve a little better than this, Hal. A friendly warning would have been nice. Instead, you call us in here like children? He stood up. We deserved better. I'm sorry you feel that way, said Dr. Jensen, standing up as well. The board of trustees will hear about this, said Mom. She got up, too. I'm sure they will, answered Dr. Jensen, crossing his arms and nodding. Mr. Tushman was the only adult still sitting down. The point of the suspension isn't punitive, he said quietly. We're trying to help Julian, too. He can't fully understand the ramifications of his actions if you keep trying to justify them away. We want him to feel some empathy. You know, I've heard just about enough, said Mom, holding her palm in front of Mr. Tishman's face. I don't need parenting advice, not from someone who doesn't have kids of his own. You don't know what it's like to see your kid having a panic attack every time he shuts his eyes to go to sleep, okay? You don't know what it's like. Her voice cracked a bit, like she was going to cry. She looked at Dr. Jensen. This affected Julian deeply, Hal. I'm sorry if that's not politically correct to say, but it's the truth, and I'm just trying to do what I think is best for my son. That's all. Do you understand? Yes, Melissa, Dr. Jensen answered softly. Mom nodded. Her chin quivered. Are we done here? Can we go now? Sure, he answered. Come on, Julian, she said, and she walked out of the office. I stood up. I admit I wasn't exactly sure what was going on. Wait, is that it? I asked. But what about my things? All my stuff's in my locker. Ms. Rubin will be getting your things ready and she'll get them to you later this week, said, answered Dr. Jensen. He looked at Dad. I'm really sorry it came to this, Jules. He held out his hand for a handshake. Dad looked at his hand but didn't shake it. He looked at Dr. Jensen. Here's the only thing I want from you, Hal, he said quietly. I want that this, all of this, be kept confidential. Is that clear? It doesn't go beyond this room. I don't want Julian turned into some kind of anti-bullying poster boy by the school. No one is to know he's been suspended. We'll make up some excuse about why he's not in school, and that's it. Are we clear, Hal? I don't want him made into an example. I'm not going to stand by while this school drags my family's reputation through the mud. Oh, by the way, in case I hadn't mentioned it before, Dad's a lawyer. Dr. Jensen and Mr. Tushman exchanged looks. We're not looking to make an example of any of our students. Dr. Jensen answered, The suspension really is about a reasonable response to unreasonable behavior. Give me a break, answered Dad, looking at his watch. It's massive overreaction. Dr. Jensen looked at Dad, and then he looked at me. Julian, he said, looking me right in the eye, can I ask you something point blank? I looked at Dad, who nodded. I shrugged. Do you feel at all remorseful for what you've done? Dr. Jensen asked me. I thought about it a second. I could tell all the grown-ups were watching me, waiting for me to answer something magical that would make this whole situation better. Yes, I said quietly. I'm really sorry I wrote those last notes. Dr. Jensen nodded. Is there anything else you feel remorse for? He asked. I looked at Dad again. I'm not an idiot. I knew what he was dying for me to say. I just wasn't going to say it. So I looked down and shrugged. Can I ask you this then, said Dr. Jensen? Will you consider writing Augie an apology? I shrugged again. How many words does it have to be, was all I could think to say. I knew the moment I said it that I probably shouldn't have. Dr. Jensen looked at my dad, who just looked down. Julian, said dad, go find mom. Wait for me by the reception area. I'll be out in a second. Just as I closed the door on my way out, Dad started whispering something to Dr. Jensen and Mr. Tushman. It was hushed, angry whisper. When I got to the reception area, I found Mom sitting on a chair with her sunglasses on. I sat down next to her. She rubbed my back, but she didn't say anything. I think she had been crying. I looked at the clock, 10.20 a.m. Right about now, Ms. Rubin was probably going over the results of yesterday's quiz in science class. As I looked around the lobby, I had a blip of a memory that day before school started when me, Jack, Will, and Charlotte had met up here before meeting our welcome buddy for the first time. 
I remember how nervous Jack had been that day and how I didn't even know who Augie was. So much had happened since then. Dad didn't say anything when he met us in the lobby. We just walked out the doors without saying goodbye, even to the security guard at the reception desk. It was weird leaving the school when everyone was still inside. I wonder what Miles and Henry would think when I didn't come back to class. I hated that I was going to miss P.E. that afternoon. My parents were quiet the whole way back to the house. We live on the Upper West Side, which is about a half hour drive from Beecher Prep. But it felt like it took forever to get home. I can't believe I got suspended, I said. I just, just as we pulled into the parking garage in our building. It's not your fault, honey, answered mom. They have it in for us. Melissa, dad yelled, which surprised mom a bit. Yes, of course it's his fault. This whole situation is his fault. Julian, what the heck were you thinking writing notes like that? He was goaded into writing them, answered mom. We had pulled to a stop in the garage. The parking garage attendant was waiting for us to get out of the car, but we didn't get out. Dad turned around and looked at me. I'm not saying I think the school handled this right, he said. Two weeks suspension is ridiculous, but Julian, you should know better. I know, I said. It was a mistake, Dad. What We all make mistakes, said Mom. Dad turned back around. He looked at Mom. Jansen's right, Melissa. If you keep trying to justify his actions. That's not what I'm doing, Jules. Dad didn't answer right away. Then he said, I told Jensen that we're pulling Julian out of breacher prep next year. Mom was literally speechless. It took a second for what he said to hit me. You what? I said. Jules, Mom said slowly. I told Jensen that we'll finish out this year at breacher prep. Dad continued calmly. But next year, Julian's going to a different school. I can't believe this, I cried. I love Beecher Prep. Dad, I have friends. Mom! I'm not sending you back to that school, Julian, Dad said firmly. No way am I spending another dime on that school. There are plenty of other great private schools in New York City. Mom, I said. Mom wiped her hand across her face. She shook her head. Don't you think we should have talked about this first, she said to Dad. You don't agree, he countered and she rubbed her forehead with her fingers. No, I do agree, she said softly, nodding. Mom, I screamed. She turned around in her seat. Honey, I think Daddy's right. I can't believe this, I yelled, punching the car seat. They have it in for us now, she continued, because we complained about the situation with that boy. But it was your fault, I said through clenched teeth. I didn't tell you to try and get Augie thrown out of school. I didn't want you to get Tushman fired. That was you. And I'm sorry all about that, sweetheart, she said meekly. Julian, said Dad, your mom did everything she did to try and protect you. It's not her fault you wrote those notes, is it? No, but if she hadn't made such a big stink about everything, I started to say. Julian, do you hear yourself, said Dad? Now you're blaming your mom before you were blaming the other boys for writing those notes. I'm starting to wonder if what they were saying is right. Do you feel any remorse for what you've done? Of course he does, said Mom. Melissa, let him answer for himself. No. Okay, I yelled. I'm not sorry. I know everybody thinks I should be. All oh, I'm sorry for being mean to Augie. I'm sorry I talk smack about him. I'm sorry I dissed him, but I'm not, so sue me. Before Dad could respond, the garage attendant knocked on the car window. Another car had pulled into the garage, and they needed us to get out. I didn't tell anyone about the suspension. When Henry texted me a few days later asking why I wasn't in school, I told him I had strep throat. That's what we told everyone. It turns out two weeks suspension isn't so bad, by the way. I spent most of my time at home watching SpongeBob reruns and playing Knights of the Old Republic. I still, I was still supposed to keep up on my schoolwork, though. It's not like I got, I totally got to goof off. Ms. Rubin dropped by the apartment one afternoon with all my locker stuff, my textbooks, my loose leaf book, and all the assignments I would need to make up, and there was a lot. Everything went really well with social studies and English, but I had so much trouble doing the math homework that Mom got me a math tutor. Despite all the time off, I really was excited about going back. Or at least I thought I was. The night before my first day back, I had one of my nightmares again. Only this time, it wasn't me who looked like Augie. 
It was everyone else. I should have taken that as a premonition. When I got back to school, as soon as I arrived, I could tell that something was up. Something was different. The first thing I noticed is that no one was really excited to, about seeing me again. I mean, people said hello and asked me how I was feeling, but no one was like, dude, I missed you. I would have thought Miles and Henry would be like that, but they weren't. In fact, at lunchtime, they didn't even sit at our usual table. They sat with Amos. So I had to take my tray and find a place to squeeze in at Amos's table, which was kind of humiliating. And then I overheard the three of them talking about hanging out on the playground after school and shooting hoops, but no one asked me to come. The thing that was the weirdest of all though was that everyone was being really nice to Augie, like ridiculously nice. It was like I had to enter a portal into a different dimension, an alternate universe in which Augie and I had changed places. Suddenly, he was the popular one and I was the outsider. Right after last period, I pulled Henry over to talk to him. Yo, dude, why is everyone being so nice to the freak all of a sudden, I asked. Oh, um, said Henry, looking around kind of nervously. Yeah, well, people don't really call him that anymore. And then he told me about all the stuff that had gone down at the nature retreat. Basically, what had happened was that Augie and Jack got picked on by some 7th grade bullies from another school. Henry, Miles, and Amos had rescued them, got into a fight with the bullies, like with real punches flying. And then they all escaped through a corn maze. It sounded really exciting. As he was telling me, I got mad all over again that Mr. Tishman had made me miss it. Oh man, I said excitedly. I wish I'd been there. I totally would have creamed those jerks. Wait, which jerks? The seventh graders. Really? He looked puzzled, though Henry always looked a little puzzled. Because I don't know, Julian. I kind of think that if you had been there, we might not have rescued them at all. You probably would have been cheering for the seventh graders. I looked at him like he was an idiot. No, I wouldn't, I said. Seriously, he said, giving me a look. No, I said. Okay, he answered, shrugging. Yo, Henry, are you coming? Amos called from down the hallway. Look, I gotta go, said Henry. Wait, I said. Gotta go. I want to hang out tomorrow after school. Not sure, he answered, backing away. Text me tonight. We'll see. As I watched him jog away, I had this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. Did he really think I was that awful that I would have been rooting for some seventh graders while they beat up, beat Augie up? Is that the, what other people think? That I would have been that much of a dirt wad? Look, I'm the first one to say it. I don't like Augie Pullman, but I, ne I would never want to see him get beat up or anything. I mean, come on, I'm not a psycho. It really annoyed me that that's what people thought about me. I texted Henry later on, Yo, BTW, I would never have just stood by and let those creeps beat, up, beat Augie and Jack up. But he never texted me back. That last month of sc in school was awful. It's not like anyone was out and out mean to me, but I felt iced out by Amos and Henry and Miles. I just didn't feel popular anymore. No one really ever laughed at my jokes. No one wanted to hang out with me. I felt like I could disappear from school and nobody would miss me. Meanwhile, Augie was walking down the hallways like some cool dude, getting high-fived by all the jocks in the upper grades. Whatever. Mr. Tushman called me into his office one day. How's it going, Julian? He asked me. Fine. Did you ever write that apology letter I asked you to write? My dad says I'm leaving the school, so I don't have to write anything, I answered. Oh, he said, nodding. I guess I was hoping you'd want to write it on your own. Why, I asked back. Everyone thinks I'm this big dirtbag now anyway. What the heck is writing a letter going to accomplish? Julian, look. I know everyone thinks I'm this unfeeling kid who doesn't feel remorse, I said using air quotes. quotes. Julian, said Mr. Tushman, no one. Suddenly, I felt like I was about to cry, so I just interrupted him. I'm really late for class, and I don't want to get in trouble, so can I please go? Mr. Tushman looked sad. He nodded. Then I left his office without looking back. A few days later, we received an official notice from the school telling us that they had withdrawn their invitation to re-enroll in the fall. I didn't think it mattered, since Dad had told them we weren't going back anyway. 
but we still hadn't heard from the other schools I had applied to, and if I didn't get into any of them, we had planned on my going back to Breacher Prep. But now that was impossible. Mom and Dad were furious at the school, like crazy mad, mostly because they had already paid the tuition for next year in advance, and the school wasn't planning on returning the money. See, that's the thing with private schools. They can kick you out for any reason. Luckily, a few days later, we did find out that I'd gotten into my first choice private school, not far from where I lived. I'd have to wear a uniform, but that was okay. Better than having to go to breacher prep every day. Needless to say, we skipped the graduation ceremony at the end of the year. The next part is entitled, After. My parents and I went to Paris in June. The original plan was that we would return to New York in July since I was supposed to go to rock and roll camp with Henry and Miles. But after everything that happened, I didn't want to do that anymore. My parents decided to let me stay with my grandmother for the rest of the summer. Usually, I hated standing, staying with Grandmere, but I was okay about it this time. I knew that after my parents went home, I could spend the entire day in my PJs playing Halo, and Grandmare wouldn't care in the least. I could pretty much do whatever I wanted. Grandmare wasn't exactly the typical grandma type. No baking cookies for Grandmare, no knitting sweaters. She was, as Dad always said, something of a character. Even though she was in her 80s, she dressed like a fashion model, super glamorous, lots of makeup and perfume, high heels. She never woke up until 2 in the afternoon, and then she'd take at least two hours to get dressed. Once she was up, she would take me out shopping or to a museum or a fancy restaurant. I wasn't into doing, she wasn't into doing kid stuff, if you know what I mean. She'd never sit through a PG movie with me, for instance, so I ended up seeing a lot of movies that were totally age-inappropriate. Mom, I knew, would go completely ballistic if she got wind of some of the movies Grandmare took me to see. But Grandmare was French and was always saying that my parents were too American anyway. Grandmare always also didn't talk to me like I was a little kid. When I was younger, she never used baby words or even talked to me the way grown-ups usually talk to little kids. She used regular words to describe everything. Like if I would say, je veux faire pipi, meaning I want to make pipi, she would say, you need to urinate, go to, la to the lavatory. And she cursed sometimes too. Boy, could she curse. And if I didn't know what a curse word meant, all I had to do was ask her, and she would explain it to me in detail. I can't even tell you some of the words she explained to me. Anyway, I was glad to be away from New NYC for the whole summer. I was hoping that I would get all those kids out of my head. Augie, Jack, Summer, Henry, Miles, all of them. If I never saw any of those kids again, seriously, I would be the happiest kid in Paris. The only thing I was a little bummed about is that I never got to say goodbye to any of my teachers at Breacher Prep. I really liked some of them. Mr. Brown, my English teacher, was probably my favorite teacher of all time. He had always been really nice to me. I loved writing, and he was really complimentary about it, and I never got to tell him that I wasn't coming back to Breacher Prep. At the beginning of the year, Mr. Brown had told all of us that he wanted us to send him one of our own precepts over the summer. So one afternoon, while Grandmere was sleeping, I started thinking about sending him a precept from Paris. I went to one of the tourist shops down the block and bought a postcard of a gargoyle, one of those at the top of Notre Dame. The first thing I thought when I saw it was that it reminded me of Augie. And then I thought, ugh, why am I still thinking about him? Why do I still his see his face wherever I go? I can't wait to start over. And that's when it hit me, my precept. I wrote it down really quickly. Sometimes it's good to start over. There, perfect. I loved it. I got Mr. Brown's address from his teacher page on Beecher Prep website and dropped it in the mail that same day. But then after I sent it, I realized he wasn't going to understand what it meant. Not really. He didn't have the whole background story about why I was so happy to be leaving Beecher Prep and starting over somewhere new. So I decided to write him an email to tell him everything that had happened last year. I mean, not everything, 
Dad had specifically told me not to ever tell anyone about at the school about the mean stuff I did to Augie, for legal reasons, but I wanted Mr. Brown to know enough so that he would understand my precept. I also wanted him to know that I thought he was a great teacher. Mom had told everyone that I wasn't going back to Beecher Prep because we were unhappy with the academics and the teachers. I felt kind of bad about that because I didn't want Mr. Brown to ever think I was unhappy with him. So anyway, I decided to send Mr. Brown an email to T. Brown from Julian Alvans regarding my precept. Hi, Mr. Brown. I just sent you my precept in the mail. Sometimes it's good to start over. It's on a postcard of a gargoyle. I wrote this precept because I'm going to a new school in September. I ended up hating Breacher Prep. I didn't like the students, but I did like the teachers. I thought your class was great. So don't take my not going back personally. I don't know if you know the whole long story, but basically the reason I'm not going to back back to Beecher Prep is, well, not to name names, but there was one student I really didn't get along with. Actually, it was two students. You can probably guess who they are because one of them punched me in the mouth. Anyway, these kids were not my favorite people in the world. We started writing mean notes to each other. I repeat, each other. It was a two-way street. But I'm the one that got in trouble for it. Just me. It was so unfair. The truth is, Mr. Tushman had it in for me because my mom was trying to get him fired. Anyway, long story short, I got suspended for two weeks for writing the notes. No one knows this, though. It's a secret, so please don't tell anyone. The school said it had a zero tolerance policy against bullying, but I don't think what I did was bullying. My parents got so mad at the school they decided to enroll me in a different school next year. So yeah, that's the story. I really wish that that student had never come to Beecher Beecher Prep. My whole year would have been so much better. I hated having to be in his classes. He gave me nightmares. I would still be going to Beecher Prep if he hadn't been there. It's a bummer. I really liked your class, though. You were a great teacher. I wanted you to know that. I thought it was good that I hadn't named names, but I figured he'd know who I was talking about. I really didn't expect to hear back from him. But the very next day when I checked my inbox, there was an email from Mr. Brown. I was so excited. To Julian from T. Brown regarding my precept. Hi, Julian. Thanks so much for your email. I'm looking forward to getting the gargoyle postcard. I was sorry to hear you wouldn't be coming back to beat your prep. I always thought you were a great student and a gifted writer. By the way, I love your precept. I agree. Sometimes it's good to start over. A fresh start gives us a chance to reflect on the past, weigh the things we've done, and apply what we've learned from those things to the future. If we don't examine the past, we don't learn from it. As for the kids you didn't like, I do think I know who you're talking about. I'm sorry the year didn't turn out to be a happy one for you, but I hope you take a little time to ask yourself why. Things that happen to us, even the bad stuff, can often teach us a little bit about ourselves. Do you ever wonder why you had such a hard time with these two students? Was it perhaps their friendship that bothered you? Were you troubled by Augie's physical appearance? You mentioned that you started having nightmares. Did you ever consider that maybe you were just a little afraid of Augie, Julian? Sometimes fear can even can make even the nicest kids say and do things they wouldn't ordinarily say or do. Perhaps you should explore these feelings further. In any case, I wish you the best of luck in your new school, Julian. You are a good kid, a natural leader. Just remember to use your leadership for good, huh? Don't forget, always choose kind. I don't know why, but I was so, so, so happy to get that email from Mr. Brown. I knew he would be understanding. I was so tired of everyone thinking I was this demon child, you know? It was obvious that Mr. Brown knew I wasn't. I reread his email like ten times. I was smiling from ear to ear. So? Grandmere asked me. She had just woken up and was having breakfast. A croissant and a cafe au latte. Delivered from downstairs. I haven't seen you this happy all summer long. What is it that you are reading, mon cher? Oh, I got an email from one of my teachers, I answered. Mr. Brown. From your old school, she asked. I thought they were all the bad, those teachers. I thought it was good riddance to all of them. 
Grandmare had a thick French accident accent that was hard to understand sometimes. What? Good riddance, she repeated. Never mind, I thought the teachers were all stupid. The way she pronounced stupid was funny, like stupid. Not at, not all. Not Mr. Brown, I answered. So what did he write to make you so happy? Oh, nothing much, I said. It's just I thought everyone hated me, but now I know Mr. Brown doesn't. Grandmare looked at me. Why would everyone hate you, Julian? She asked. You are such a good boy. I don't know, I answered. Read me the email, she said. No, Grandmare. Read, she commanded, pointing her finger at the screen. So I read Mr. Brown's letter aloud to her. Now Grandmare knew a little bit about what happened at Be Beecher Prep, but I don't think she knew the whole story. I mean, I think Mom and Dad told her the version of the story they told everyone else, with maybe a few more details. Grandmare knew there were a couple of kids who had made my life miserable, for instance, but she didn't know the specifics. She knew I'd gotten punched in the mouth, but she didn't know why. If anything, Grandmare probably assumed I'd gotten bullied, and that was why I was leaving the school. So, there were parts of Mr. Brown's email that she really didn't understand. What does he mean? She said, squinting it as she tried to read my, off my screen, Augie's physical appearance. Ks, say, Ks, One of the kids that I didn't like, Augie, he had this awful facial deformity, I answered. It was really bad. He looked like a gargoyle. Julian, she said, that is not very nice. Sorry. And this boy, he was not sympathetic. She said innocently, he was not nice to you? He Was he a bully? I thought about that. No, he wasn't a bully. So why did you not like him? I shrugged. I don't know. He just got on my nerves. What do you mean you don't know? She answered quickly. Your parents told me that you were leaving school because of some bullies. No? You got punched in the face. No? Well, yeah, I got punched, but not by the deformed kid, by his friend. Ah, so his friend was the bully. No, not exactly, I said. I can't say there were bullies, Grandmere. I mean, it wasn't like that. We just didn't get along, that's all. We hated each other. It's kind of hard to explain. You kind of had to be there. Here, let me show you what he looked like. Then maybe you'll understand a little bit better. I mean, not to sound mean, but it was really hard having to look at him every day. He gave me nightmares. I logged onto Facebook and found our class picture and zoomed in on Augie's face so she could see. She put her glasses on to look at it and spent a long time studying his face on the computer screen. I thought she would react the way Mom had reacted when she first saw that picture of Augie, but she didn't. She just nodded to herself, and then she closed the laptop. Pretty bad, huh? I said to her. She looked at me. Julian, she said. I think maybe your teacher is right. I think you were afraid of this boy. What? No way, I answered. I'm not afraid of Augie. I mean, I didn't like him. In fact, I kind of hated him, but not because I was afraid of him. Sometimes we hate things we are afraid of, she said. I made a face like she was talking crazy. She took my hand. I know what it is like to be afraid, Julianne, she said, holding her finger up to my face. There was a little boy that I was afraid of when I was a little girl. Let me guess, I answered, sounding bored. I bet he looked just like Augie. Grandmare shook her head. No, his face was fine. So why were you afraid of him, I asked. I tried to make my voice sound as disinterested as possible, but Grandmare ignored my bad attitude. She just sat back in her chair, head slightly tilted, and I could tell by looking into her eyes that she had gone somewhere far away.